Welcome, Dr. Vikar Shalala and Prof. Adam Mohamed, to this video podcast of the WJCM, that's the British Journal of Clinical Medicine. So the two of you, and together with your co-authors, have just published in the July issue of this journal on colorectal screening with an emphasis um, of how we do or run the screening program in South Africa. So will you kind of unpack firstly, as a background, the prevalence in Africa, and particularly South Africa, why we need to screen for this cancer? Okay, you go first. Okay, yeah. Um, so it's always been thought that incidence rates of colorectal cancer in Africa was quite low, and that has traditionally been the view. But the landscape of colorectal cancer is changing globally, and certainly within Africa as well. And uh, the, the pattern of disease, as well as the age of onset, is certainly unique in Africa. And what we are seeing with urbanization is an increasing rate of colorectal cancer in lower income countries, while it's stabilizing in high income countries. And probably stabilizing in high income countries due to screening programs and more lifestyle awareness, and the opposite essentially happening in lower income companies, uh, countries. Sorry. So what we see in Africa is a lot of young cancers, in black patients particularly, and aggressive cancers. We often find patients in their 40s with stage 3, stage 4 metastatic disease cancers. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that, and a lot of it is, is anecdotal, uh, based on experience of colorectal surgeons and gastroenterologists, and that highlights the need for us to actually keep registries and publish this data. Because we're all seeing it in clinical practice, but we don't actually have the data to prove it. And I think it's going to become an increasing problem. We're all noticing it on the ground with urbanization. And the one thing that's also probably been hypothesized by many clinicians is that our pattern of inheritance or our genetic basis, especially in young black patients of colorectal cancer, is not the same as Western. So probably not following the traditional adenoma carcinoma sequence with APC genes as much but more following the microsatellite instability pathway uh, with Lynch type or hereditary non polyposis type cancers. So we're seeing a lot of these younger cancers and with urbanization and lifestyle changes, it's only going to get worse. And we predict in the next 10, 20, 30 years that we're going to see a drastic rise in colorectal cancers. And that's essentially where the basis of the paper came in to create the awareness and to try and avert the problem before we we reach it. And I think Prof, from a burden of disease point of view, if you look internationally it's a third rank carcinoma. If you look at the African literature, a lot of the data is coming out from North Africa. But if you go down to Southern Africa where we are mainly, we ranked, we, our data is coming out better since the government implemented the new rule of the pathology and registering cancer as a, almost like a PMB condition. So the data is coming out now, but data from before we don't have. And now we're looking at it being ranked probably the fourth and fifth for males and females respectively in South Africa as burden of disease. And what we're seeing is our pattern is paralleling the rest of the world when it comes to the African patient, that they have it at a younger age and it's more aggressive. So one would say, why are we only talking about this now? Where was this all the time? And I think it's about access to healthcare, it's about data collection, registries, and people not talking about it previously when they had it. And it's getting everyone on the same page and realizing this is as important as cancers 1, 2, and 3, breast cancers, prostate cancers, and learning more and more about this. But it needs greater awareness that this is a silent killer and we need to be aware of it, and it can have an impact on outcomes if we act now. Okay, so what about, so a couple of aspects about why this increase. So, I mean, since uh, 1994 when we became democratic and the urbanization predominantly of black people started happening quite quite a lot, is it just urbanization, it's also just what goes with urbanization, it's the diet change, smoking, obesity, is that playing a role? 
I think definitely, if you look at South Africa, we're ranking in the top five countries in the world for obesity. You look at the data that's coming out for teenage obesity, we are the top five in the world. So you put into the fact urbanization, obesity, diet changes, access to health care, that's why we're actually getting a bigger impact. And as you see, the lifespan also increasing of, of the African population in South Africa from pre-1990 to now, you're going to see a natural increased tendency for colon cancer. And we know that the longer you live, the greater is your chance of getting colon cancer. And if we pick up the index case and we start looking at that family, and this is the crux, look for three generations of families of cancer, we will actually be able to make proper screening in a high-risk population group. So I think the diet is definitely there. And obesity, diabetes, again, the silent killers in African population group, hypertension, diabetes, all of these are linked as risk factors for cancer. And we underestimate the urban diet with preservatives and all of these other artificial products in our foods that are known to be risk factors. They might be soft science, but if you add them up, cumulatively we are packing more risk factors to an individual already at risk. So now that we've got a bit of a background of the prevalence of carcinoma and you've highlighted this as a kind of a significant problem, how would you recommend that we start a screening program for colon cancer? So, uh, it's clear that we need a screening program because you've clearly said there's enough science that early pickup translates to improved mortality, correct? Correct. The other thing about colorectal cancer which makes it unique in the sense it's preventable and avoidable, similar to cervical cancer with pushing the, you know, the, the reach for HPV vaccination. And it's a similar concept. It's a very prevalent cancer and it doesn't need to be. So that's where uh, the highlights of the need of screening as well. And the other aspect, especially with regards to Africa, younger, more aggressive disease, is it's targeting our workforce. It's targeting, our, we're finding, you know, quite late stage disease in, uh, patients in their 40s, and that's the predominant workforce in South Africa. It's contributing to the GDP. So screening is not only in terms of prevalence, but it's also going to help enhance our GDP and our economic uh, output as well. Um, with regards to starting a program, Prof, uh, I think it's, there's multiple challenges and there's multiple avenues which have to be tackled concurrently. I think focusing on one avenue without focusing on others is probably going to just re result in a delay in actually getting a screening program going. So while we're actually looking at means to screen in terms of investigations, we also need to be build capacity to actually roll out the program get invitations to the population, decide what's the target population that needs to be screened, get access to care. But also, there's no point getting a screening program going if you pick up the cases and then you can't offer them therapy. So we need to build ancillary services to offer pathways to care in those that we do pick up positive uh, screening tests in. So we need to have pathways to treat colorectal cancer. So we need to build oncology services, radiology services, pathology services, interventional endoscopy, surgery. And that needs to be done concurrently. Um, no use focusing on screening if we pick up all of these cases and we can't actually help the positive cases. So there's a multi-pronged approach and it needs to be done concurrently. Even things like postal services. So the UK is probably one of the best screening success stories um, globally. The UK is really set good colonoscopy standards, they've regulated the ability to do screening colonoscopies, tightly regulated, you have to meet key performance indices and you have to maintain them. To train someone to do screening colonoscopy, your centre has to be accredited. So their service is essentially a postal service where you can post off a stool sample um, in the mail and you get your result and if your result is positive, you then get booked for your colonoscopy. So that just highlights another issue that we have in terms of postal services. So it's a whole, it's the whole system and we definitely need governmental buy-in and it needs to be made a priority. We have a two-pronged system in this country, a private sector and a public sector. But I mean, a lot of the patients and in fact, if we look at the GP practices, well, basically they fall into a primary healthcare group. How would, what would you tell a GP 
how frequently he needs to assess or screen a patient, or which patients would he screen? So I, I think, Prof, we have to get the buy-in first. Nobody's going to take up screening if they don't see the buy-in. And that's where we have to put the information out there. The recent paper out from the Holland, their actual survival rate is increasing. Their average lifespan is 75. Most centers want you to stop screening at 75. Their, their average lifespan is 75, and they're pushing, and they're actually seeing a reduction in colorectal cancer because they've implemented this program. And the value and cost benefit is there. The thing with the GP and with patients and with society at large is to show them that it works, it's cost effective, risk benefit is there to have it done. And there's so many different modalities to use for screening and what we can do. It's to see what's viable and what works for us. The private healthcare system and the state healthcare system, there's such a discordant, but it's still so opportunistic, even in the well-resourced private care setting, because not all medical aids are the same. Again, we have to take away the aspect of opportunity, opportunistic screening done, because one of the principles is it has to be accessible to all if you want to talk about a population level impact. And I think that's what we have to do. And I think Vikash will discuss now the actual nuances of saying, what's our proposal? What do we suggest for South Africa? Maybe go with that, Vikash. Yeah, so at the moment, well, the vision and the current uh, situation. So the current situation, I think it's well, well known that we don't have the capacity to do population-wide screening. And so we need to do targeted uh, screening rather than organized screening. So at the moment, I think our approach needs to be to target high-risk populations. And it's exactly what Prof mentioned uh, with the obesity, diabetes, family history, first-degree relatives, um, finding high-risk populations, and that needs to be the initial approach uh, before we can actually move to an organized population-based uh, screening modality. So we know, and it's, it's been shown in papers as well, that our population develops cancer at a younger age. And this has been shown globally as well. The American College of Gastroenterology initially, initially recommended screening or suggest screening at the age of 50. And they've also rec dropped the recommendation down to 45. And that's, that's fallen in suit by many other countries as well. And the initial basis was on the basis of black patients. But they're seeing it in other populations at a younger age as well. So I think based on our population and the data of early cancers, we certainly need to be starting earlier with screening, not at age 50. Um, Prof highlighted all of the risk factors. Uh, there are risk calculators available, and that's something that's easy. Uh, we all have access to phones, we all have apps on our phones, we all have the internet. You can simply pull out your phone while you're consulting with the patient, plug in their details into one of these calculators. You can actually show the patient, this is your risk of developing colorectal cancer in the next 10 years, and this is your risk, or this is the amount of risk we're able to avert by uh, putting you through a screening program by doing either a stool-based test or colonoscopy. So we think we should definitely start earlier in our population. And we think even 45 is probably a bit late to be looking at probably around 40, and even considering earlier, especially in patients with a family history of colorectal cancer. So we're talking about our unique population, the black South African patients uh, as well. So I think, Prof, directly to your question, how do we do it? I think we have a fair enough strong primary health care system, both state and private, and if we were to not be disrespectful to GPs, put them at the level of primary health care. That group, plus the clinic system that we have currently in this country, I think we would be able to make a positive impact by saying, this is what we can do. We do the fecal immunochemistry test. I think the guide based uh, testing for uh, blood is, for me, I think it would become too cumbersome, too many false positives diet changes in a country where we have issues of nutrition and if we were to do the fecal uh, immunochemistry test we would be able to start there with two simple tests a year it's cost effective although it's slightly expensive test but your value of false positives will be decreased and we start that and you use the risk calculator the gp the nurse here's your app here's your technology put it in there if you're getting this high risk we can now offer you this test, you do this test, you get referral to a state hospital or to a higher center, and we start doing that. We start finding high risk families, and we start, and this also creates awareness. So when we're up and ready, 
as a government political will to change what we need to do, we've already laid the groundwork of people being aware of what we're doing. So we're starting somewhere rather than thinking about something and for the last 20 years have done nothing. That's what I would suggest from a GP point of view, risk calculator, engage with the patient, real risk factors, family history. And we're not talking purely colon cancer family history. What about the other cancers, uterine cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancer? Nowadays, everything is linked. And if we can encourage colon cancer, it will have a knock-on effect for breast cancer and other cancers as well. So, in a way, I mean, that was part of the uh, reason that uh, I suggested that you write this, your manuscript regarding screening programs for colon cancer. It's a form of education at all levels of, 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 of the healthcare system, at primary and secondary. Because many, I mean, even the, so often, as you know, screening programs change, and I thought this would be a reasonably good update to say, well, where do we start? And if we're going to start, what would you suggest would be the kind of the most common test you would re recommend? You think the fit test would be the number one that you would suggest? I would. I, I agree. I don't think we have the capacity to offer everyone colonoscopy as a screening test. Um, I think a fit test will help, you know, filter out those that actually need a colonoscopy. It's cheaper. Uptake is good. So people are averse to colonoscopy with regards to having taking bowel prep, sedation, coming to the hospital, you know, the procedure itself. So if you look at data, although colonoscopy is the gold standard in terms of sensitivities and specificities in picking up pre and malignant as well as malignant lesions, it's all about uptake. Um, if you look at the recent Nordic trial, and that was the big trial which created a lot of buzz in the colorectal cancer and screening world, uh, which was published very recently in NEJ. They invited about 455 or so patients, if I remember correctly, to testing. And about 45% of patients actually came to colonoscopy. So their number needed to, to screen to pick up colorectal cancer was a lot higher. But if, you, if every patient had to come, they would have twice the amount of success there. So if you look at data, uh, fit compares to colonoscopy purely on the basis that the uptake is higher. People are more... Um, easier or more willing to send up a stool sample. And again, it can be sent in the comfort of your own home and posted in the mail. You don't need to go out and wait in the long queue and use a bathroom, you know, that might not be, it might be shared by many people. So I think uptake with FIT is certainly going to be a lot better. In capacity with colonoscopy, I don't think we are anywhere near reaching the ability to screen with colonoscopy with regards to capacity. But I think it highlights and in implements and encourages us to change where this country is going from a professional, efficient healthcare system. We start something, it will have a knock-on effect. It's a pyramid effect. You're pulling everything up by the string and everything just gets better. So if I were to give you an example, if you look at the UK, Holland, Germany, these are well resourced from specialists and doctors point of view, but they have nurses doing endoscopy. and we can train clinical associates, that unknown group. They have the skill set and I've seen that and I've trained clinical associates to do gastroscopy, colonoscopies. Nurses overseas are also doing basic polypectomy. So it does lend us to changing the dynamic landscape of healthcare service. We don't have to say it has to be a gastroenterologist. It has to be a trained certified endoscopist Exactly like in the UK, you have to meet the requirements, you have to meet the key performance indices, you have to be monitored, and your outcomes are so good. And then you decrease. The biggest problem that we're seeing in post-screening post is interval cancers, which means you're getting cancers after you've had a colonoscopy and you are clear that you're getting. And if we follow this and learn from the other countries, I think we can offer an amazing cancer awareness treatment and screening program beyond just colon cancer. We're teaching your first contact person. Here's a risk calculator, here's this, here's this. You're age 42, you need a mammogram, you need a colonoscopy, you need this here. Your blood pressure is checked, hypertension is checked. I think we will end up being at the foremost of giving the best care at a primary health care level just by simplicity of what we're doing. So that's an important point you, you bring up. I mean, most patients are aware that, at least the women, that 
they need to do mammograms on a regular basis. But that doesn't exist for any of the other cancers. And even for prostate cancer, there are many patients who, in fact, uh, are, are, not, are not getting their regular checks at, at all. And so, with this rising prevalence of colon cancer, certainly we need to kind of educate, firstly, the healthcare providers, first and foremost, who then, at the primary care level, can drive this agenda of screening for cancers in general, particularly okay, yeah, can, cancer of the colon. Yeah, I just think breast cancer is the advocacy groups, the doctors, everyone are aware about it. And we as healthcare providers, as myself, we can't. People at the forefront of gastroenterology, we're not really doing a good enough job of increasing the awareness, educating healthcare practitioners. And I think that's, it's a for, you know, besides just implementing, we need to educate, educate, and educate. And we need a change in the mindset of the government regarding this cancer. This is just not about more expenses. It has a knock-on benefit that we won't see today. If we implement now, we will see an effect in 10 years. But if we wait another 10 years, we are going to be doing another HIV catastrophe in this country again. It's the same principle. We're going to pick up things too late, we're going to have problems. Yeah, I think that's a very, very, very important point. The effect of a screening program is not felt now. It's felt in a minimum time of a decade. And our, with our urbanization and our lifestyle and the expected increase, before waiting to land ourselves in the pot, we actually need to, to do something now. And I think it's, uh, that, that's very important. We can avert the crisis, but we need to actually act soon before we actually land up in the crisis. Then it's too late to avert. So I think that's a very, very important point. Just one uh, comment with regards to testing as well. What's very, always been the flavor of the month or very topical is the concept of liquid biopsies and blood-based screening tests picking up molecular and genetic markers in blood which is shed by cancer cells. And um, that's probably going to be a good thing coming up in the future, but we know in here where we need to be advantage of that is doing one blood test and screening for five, six, seven cancers uh, at one go. Um, so they certainly promise there. It's on the horizon. There's lots more data coming out, lot, a lot of new genetic and molecular markers being developed and looked at, but definitely not where it needs to be at this point for colorectal cancer, especially with picking up pre-malignant uh, precursor lesions. That's where we really want to focus on. Yeah, that's certainly on the horizon, but probably will be an expensive test. Um, so before we end, uh, to say part of the reason for this manuscript was I think the general public, rather than the public, the health professionals, really need to be educated as to the rising prevalence of this disease. And some early screening programs needs to be initiated. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. Education is like we had with the HIV campaign. It, it started with educating the community at the community-based level. And that's definitely what we need to drive. Like you say, no one has heard of colorectal cancer. No one is aware of it. And that's why we're seeing such late disease as well. For me, from a GP point of view or from a primary health care nurse point of view, use the risk calculator, simple app. It's not a lot of thinking. The app does it for you put in the risk, risk stratify and up refer as soon as possible and start there. I think a, a start is better than pro procrastination and, and to reach out if you're not sure. And if you find one cancer of any cancer, index the entire family for a thorough history or refer onwards. Taking a good family tree is crucial, three generation family tree. Um, yeah, it is very, very important. Just one last comment, and that's where we really need governmental buy-in, because a lot of testing and a lot of capacity is in the private sector, and fit testing is covered by some of the medical aid funders, they do recommend it, but in state it's a completely different situation. So while we're educating the public and the community, we can't do that without government buy-in. So we really do need support from government uh, and to drive these processes, we can't do it without them. So we really need to create the awareness and show them that this is a potential financial crisis. We're potentially going to take out a lot of our working class group, young working class individuals are contributing to our community, our GDP are going to be affected. 
and they need to see the value of that. So we definitely need governmental buy-in. That's a, an urgent plea to, to, to create awareness with government. So, because our time's up, so I'd just like to, on behalf of the journal, thank you both for this interesting uh, video podcast and highlighting, I think, what's going to become quite a significant health issue in this country going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.